There's a lot of foundations and it sounds like we've got a lot of builders in the room here and so they are, they're going to be the ones that are going to be best able to inform you of the types of foundations that work best in this ecosystem. But um, literally they're all relevant. So we've got slab on grade, grade beam, ICF, rubble trench, cinder block and piles. We basically just need some way to be able to support the greenhouse um, and ensure also lock it into the ground so it doesn't blow away. The greenhouse in Invermere has a slab on grade to make it wheelchair accessible. And I think for community greenhouses, accessibility is really important. But um, I think the mistake that was made there was that the entire space is uh, designed to that specification and it makes it really difficult to grow plants. So it's important that plants have access to the soil and I think there's different ways that we can achieve those accessibility objectives without having to, to um, create a concrete slab underneath the entire greenhouse. So that was a big learning from that particular um, that space. And so really it's going to come down to what's readily available for you in your ecosystem and what's going to um, achieve the objectives that you're trying to achieve um, and hopefully what's cost effective and, and every different place that you go is going to have different types of trades and different foundation systems that they use and so trying to find that bioregionally appropriate uh, foundation is important and likely something you're going to have to um, converse with your local trades about if you're not uh, a builder yourself. And that's literally what I recommend that folks do when they're designing their own greenhouse. Get involved with the trade, figure out what parts you're going to do yourself or none at all, and find out what they would do in, in your shoes because they're going to be uh, very experienced with regards to what happens here. So the knee wall is, sounds more complex than it is. It's essentially just a, a front end piece here that allows snow to accumulate without compromising the ability for this vent to open up. Believe it or not, at minus 30, my greenhouse will be above 20 degrees Celsius during the day. So my vents have to open in the middle of winter. It's a wonderful space to hang out. I don't necessarily grow four seasons, but we have a hammock that we hang in there and we hang out in there and it's, it's a great way to deal with sads. You don't need a light book, you just need a greenhouse. You go out into your greenhouse, you lie in the sun, you get your suntan in the middle of the day, come back in, recharge, it's amazing. Um, so they're not just greenhouses, they could be sunrooms, but because you can get that kind of thermal rise in one of these structures, you need to make sure that it has the ability to ventilate. And that's what a new wall is. So in our climate, I typically say this front wall is about three feet. It's a good kind of rule of thumb. You can go a little bit more than that. It's obviously going to depend on the amount of glazing you have because that's going to dictate how much snow is actually going to accumulate <coughs> down here. So it might actually be four or five feet. Yep. I know I'm ignorant, but... What exactly is glazing? Glazing is glass. It's glass. Okay. Basically, a translucent surface that allows the light through. So glass. It's it's not. It's not necessary. It's a translucent material that allows light through. So it could be polycarbonate. It could be uh, solar wrap. It could be glass. Um, it could be acrylic. There's a whole suite of materials that you potentially will choose depending again on what your objectives are. But it's really important. I had a client once that built a greenhouse. And the sunroom manufacturer said to her, um, we've got to put UV protection on this glazing, otherwise it's going to overheat, right? And guess what didn't grow in her greenhouse? So you have to allow up to 70% of the light through the glazing, which means that every greenhouse will always overheat. We actually want the greenhouse to overheat because it means we're getting enough light and we compensate for the overheating, which isn't great for the plants, by adding enough ventilation in, which is why we need a knee wall there um, and proper ventilation design, which we're about to get into. How am I doing for time? Okay. So ventilation is really important. If in real estate, it's about location, location, location. On greenhouses, it's about ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. Super important. You cannot overventilate one of these structures. In my course, I've got rules of thumb, but basically the rule of thumb is put the biggest vents on there that you can afford or you can fit into the space. Uh, and so we achieve that with a number of different things. Fans is what most people go to. It's your last line of defense. I think the best thing that you can do is put in passive vents that take advantage of stack effect um, and thermal siphoning. We put on doors on both sides of the greenhouses. 
Potentially we have temporary blowout panels that we can take out in the middle of summer to get cross ventilation. This also allows for our pollinators to come in and um, you cannot over ventilate a greenhouse. And then lastly, we accommodate for places that you can put in fans, but I try and get people to do that as a last ditch effort because that takes electricity to run. So why not try and design systems that are literally passive, that don't need a lot of additional energy to operate. So glazing, 70% um, transmissivity. So this is the amount of light that comes through the actual glazing material itself. It used to be, if you go back to the 70s, when they were starting to build these structures, that they would use glass, which has a really high transmissivity. It lets a lot of light through. But glass also has a problem in that it um, is shatterable by hail, which is a design consideration for Cochrane. Um, but also it uh, creates, there's a lot of refraction in glass if you get the, the angle wrong. Now with polycarbonate uh, materials, the refraction is less of an issue, which allows us to use uh, shallower slopes on the design of our greenhouse because we don't have to worry about how the light hits the surface. Most of it's going to go through um, with polycarbonate. So polycarbonate has been an incredible uh, improvement in technology with regards to greenhouses and it has made the design of these structures a lot simpler. Um, they're hail, it's hail proof, it's designed for snow load, um, so it's strong, it has a, long, a, a large um, PSF rating, so pounds per square foot, it can hold a lot of load if it's properly supported and designed. Um, and these are three different manufacturers. If you're looking for a local supplier, professional gardener, or um, Acrylco manufacturing in Calgary, uh, we'll sell this stuff to you guys in bulk. So lots of places to get these materials. You'll notice that with the polycarbonate as well, it's kind of cool, it's got multi-wall. So it's kind of in the same way triple glaze uh, windows or double glazed windows, we can get multi-wall glazing in our polycarbonate. It's fairly expensive and, um, and it does have a lifespan, it's about 15 years. One thing to note, this is worth the entire <laughs> cost of admission today, uh, make sure the glazing is oriented the correct way out. It's, it's, it's like a check valve, you can only put the light through it in one direction. If you do the other way around, it UV degrades and then the hail goes through. And I know that from direct experience. So read the label, put it in the right direction towards the sun. Um, so light is, is very important. Um, we're really trying to stay up in this higher region of light um, in terms of foot candles. Foot candles is actually an inferior methodology to measure light, but it's easy for us to wrap our head around. The uh, greenhouse industry uses something called PAR, which is photosynthetic active radiation. Um, if you really want to become a greenhouse nerd, you're going to want to Google PAR, P-A-R. Um, but generally speaking, we're trying to stay um, you know, above this number right here. A lot of people don't realize this, but office level light is about 100 foot candles. Okay, we we want to be like basically 1,000 up um, in order to get good plant growth. So that's why you can't grow tomatoes in an office without having direct sunlight coming in from the south side. So what I typically tell to people when they're designing greenhouses is design it for three seasons because trying to mimic the sun is super expensive. The sun puts out 800 watts per meter squared everywhere on earth and uh, the amount of energy that it takes to, to put out that kind of level of energy is, is quite high. So if we can utilize the sun for those three months, that saves us an enorm enormous amount of energy and potentially also infrastructure and then depending on the plants that you choose inside of your greenhouse, there's still a lot of plants that will be quite fine with going into dormancy that are outside of our climate zone for those few months. So they'll be fine with lower levels of light. And then when the light levels come back up naturally on the other side of the season, you've got um, the ability to start using those plants again. Um, so these are just a few rules of thumb. Um, in the tool that we built, we also created an artificial So there's a, I could be here all day talking about those plants, um, but there's a great book by a guy in Wyoming, Shane, <coughs> it's called The Greenhouse Gardener's Companion. Um, every pastoral greenhouse owner should read that book. Uh, he runs a large community um, passive solar greenhouse in Wyoming and a very similar climate to ours. And he's got a whole plant list in there 
and he talks about their nutrition needs, their water needs, their light needs, um, their thermal needs, and um, it's a great place to, to start. Um, so we have an artificial light calculator, which will help you to figure out how much lighting you need and, uh, and how much that's going to end up costing. So you can put in the cost per kilowatt hour, the number of hours that you're going to need to operate those lights, and then it'll kick out an annual and monthly cost of operation. Insulation is really important, and just what I've noticed over the years is that about R20 in your walls is a really good kind of heuristic. Um, anything beyond that, and you're kind of wasting your money because the, the R value in your glazing is going to be pushing it at about R2. So it turns out that most of the thermal loss in a greenhouse is actually going to come through the glazing surface. Um, and so there's no point trying to beef up your walls if you've got this really poor insulator in your glazing. So there's a whole bunch of different insulation materials. Um, there's hempcrete, that would make a really good greenhouse. We've got uh, Nexem blocks here, I think they're called, is it Nexem? Yeah, they used to be called Duracell. That's a wood fiber impregnated with um, concrete. Um, we've got uh, refrigeration panels. So these are steel skinned with EPS in the middle. Those go together really quick. They've got lap joints. There's a company in Innisfail that sells these called that better panel? It's right there. Yes, thank you. I didn't realize that. Thanks for noticing. I'm just, I was just doing that to see if you're paying attention. Uh, friends of mine used old um, tree planting um, trays, and they figured out how to turn them into SIP, or sorry, uh, ICF blocks. Probably won't meet code, um, but an interesting way of using them. Um, and so Typically, we need a combination of insulation, thermal mass, and then some sort of a protective layer on the outside to protect it from rain. And so, again, there's an, a plethora of different options out there. The principles to think about when you're building your greenhouse is vapor. You're going to have really high vapor loads on the inside, which can create toxic mold. And I'm very cognizant of that because what's the point in having a space to hang out in and get your vitamin D and grow your food if you're going to get toxic mold into your lungs. So I personally like um, materials that are washable, preferably even with a pressure washer, that are not going to harbor mold, um, and that are going to be able to manage high vapor um, uh, loads inside. So I get a lot of people that come to me and wanting to partner greenhouses and houses together. The idea is really sexy and romantic and all that stuff but you really have got to be careful about the vapor transmission between the greenhouse and the building. Um, and so I generally sway people away from it uh, because the cost uh, to get a building scientist involved and make sure that you're not going to create any issues is, is substantial. Um, just again, the tool that you guys can get access to if you want to design your own greenhouse. This tool has a bunch of data visualization in it, so it'll actually tell you where all your energy is being lost. It's almost always the glazing. And so the other kind of mistake that people make when they're specking glazing is they go with the most expensive glazing they can find, which might bring you from R1.8. And, and R val is everybody familiar with R values? So an R value is basically the measure of how much energy moves through a surface. So the higher the number, the, the better it holds energy. So R1.8 is really low. Most of your houses would have walls between R8 and R20. Okay, the, the glazing material is basically like a t-shirt. Okay, like a, a piece of paper has an R value of 1. So your glazing is going to have about an R 1.8. But to go from R 1.8 to let's say R 3, will end up adding like double the cost in your glazing. Now the thing is, is the R 1.8 is still going to allow your greenhouse to heat up in minus 30 when the sun is out. The difference between R 1.8 and R 3 is what, how it interacts with the, with the nighttime temperatures. So the cheapest way to improve the thermal efficiency of the glazing portion of your greenhouse is to go with a kind of midline glazing surface and then spend your money and time building an insulative curtain. Because I can literally get a construction tarp which from, from Canadian Tire, which is inexpensive, put some air, airplane cables in, and I can double the R value at night when I go to bed as soon as the sun goes down just by pulling an insulative tarp over top of my glazing in the evening for a fraction of the cost of going to R, R3 and it'll be more effective than going to R3 because um, uh, because 
now I've got probably R6 in that assembly with the, the, the tarp and the glazing material. And what's really interesting is that this giant chunk of energy that you're losing through that glazing at night when the sun goes down literally gets cut in half. And if you get a better insulative tarp, you can cut it down to a quarter. Because glazing surfaces are actually your heating engine. So we need to have lots of transmissivity through the day, um, but we want to have very little transmissivity at night. And ironically, as we go up in our value in the glazing, guess what happens to your transmissivity? It goes down. So our value and transmissivity are inversely correlated, which means that as the insulative value of the glazing goes up, our ability for, for our plants to be healthy goes down. So we actually want a high transmissivity, decent R value, and a thermal curtain to pull over at night. That's the optimal solution in this ecosystem. Um, so thermal mass is going to be um, achieved through a number of different things. Our greenhouse has a rocket mass heater. I don't know if I would do that again. Um, you guys are going to see that today. We'll cut up some wood and see if we can light it. Um, I really like the um, gabion walls. I think they're very aesthetically pleasing. There's lots of rock around here. They're easy to build uh, to a certain height. If you go past a certain height, it gets expensive and um, dangerous, potentially. Um, this is the greenhouse that has the greenhouse in the front, kitchen in the middle, and root cellar in the bottom. Um, there's a series of thermal mass options in here. So we've got air being sucked from the ceiling. We're going to see one of those greenhouses today at Hull Services. We can pump air underground and recirculate the air through the greenhouse. Now this is a kind of a neat system. Um, so basically when the air gets really hot up here, it's hot and humid, we move the air underground, which then cools it down and dehumidifies it. So it's the change of vapor state, so going from vapor to liquid, that releases tons of energy into the soil. And so the air comes out dehumidified and cool on this side. And so that happens all day long once the temperature in the greenhouse gets too warm. And then at nighttime, when the greenhouse drops below a threshold temperature, in other words, when you have to put a sweater on when you're drinking a beer in there, the, um, the fan will turn on again and extract that thermal energy, evaporate the water off of the soil, which then releases the energy back into the air and puts it into the greenhouse. So we're actually using the soil underneath the greenhouse as a thermal storage mechanism. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, and so, and then the other thing that we've got here, I think I'll show you in the integrated design. How am I doing for time? Okay. So um, one of the reasons that we brought the root cellar into here is Actually, I'm going to wait, wait to talk about that um, towards the end here. So, so there's some rules of thumb for thermal mass that you can use. Uh, Dan Shira wrote a book called The Passive Solar House. And in that book, he details out how much thermal mass you need per square foot of glazing. Now, just keep this in mind for a second. When you build a passive house, okay, and the, there's actually a, a type of building system called passive house, these homes are designed to consume 90% less energy than conventional construction. They're incredible. But a passive a house designed to that standard is going to have anywhere from 10 to 20% of the southern surface of the building glazed. So 10 to 20% of the building is going to be in glass. That's it. Not very much. Anything beyond 12% in glazing on the south side of the building, your, your building's going to overheat. And the way that they compensate for that overheating is by adding more thermal mass into the building. So concrete floors, concrete benches, cob benches, anything that's going to store thermal energy. Probably a lot of you have seen greenhouses with water inside of them in barrels. Water is a very good um, thermal storage medium. It has some downsides to it. It freezes and, and can cause problems there. But um, when we're thinking about a passive solar greenhouse, what percentage of the southern surface is glazed? 100%. So you've basically got a gas, sorry, an alcohol-powered roadster that you're dealing with. And so one of the ways that we try and slow that roadster down just a little bit is by putting some concrete on the bumper to slow it down. And so a combination of uh, thermal mass and venting is how we manage the overheating effect within the actual greenhouse itself. And so there's some basic rules of thumb that we can use, or that most people can use without getting into complex thermodynamic um, calculations. 
And so this tool allows you to choose different thermal mass materials. Um, and then each material that you choose has an associated amount of energy that it can carry per uh, kilogram or cubic meter um, of material. And so that's what this calculator allows you to do. Um, the subterranean heating and cooling system, which we just talked about, is essentially designing a system to pull hot, humid air out of the greenhouse, pump it underground, and recirculate it. So we've got a, a basic design tool for that as well. The rule of thumb here for the subterranean heating and cooling system is that we're trying to get about in between four and eight air changes per hour through that system. And the reason there's a big range there, and, and so this is my full disclosure on it, everybody gets really excited about these systems, is that uh, there's not a lot of great literature out there to prove that they work. And if I said that, that they do work 100%, I'd be lying to you. So we're going to see one of these systems today. We're, we're actively mo uh, monitoring it with uh, temperature probes. And anecdotally, it's working incredible. Um, so Vaden, who uh, runs that greenhouse at Hull Services, um, has told me that the greenhouse barely went below zero this summer. It's completely off-grid. There's no natural gas heater in there. Uh, they are going to put a natural gas heater into it just because they've got plants that can't go below a certain temperature to make sure that they don't lose those plants. Um, but anecdotally, it, it, it works very well. Um, so it's one of the projects that I would like to study further. Um, but uh, yeah, I won't make promises about it absolutely uh, functioning. We need to do more studies on it. Um, so once you know what your heat loss is by putting in your R value, your glazing, and your infiltration rate, and these are all drop-down menus, they're very, very simple to use, um, then you can actually choose different fuels, so whether it's going to be electricity, propane, natural gas, wood, um, I even put coal in there, probably shouldn't have, but I did. <laughs> um, and then you can choose from a drop-down list of, of woods that you can choose from. Um, in an ideal world, your permaculture property would be designed to grow the fuel that you need to burn within the systems that you're operating on your property. So um, our gray water and sewage would be used to grow the fuel that our houses would burn. We'd stop looking at septic effluent as a liability and we start looking at it as an opportunity. And we can very, very accurately estimate what kind of growth rates we can expect on our trees per year and what the BTU value of that biomass actually is. Um, that's where I think humanity should be going, uh, especially in this ecosystem, is that our solar energy in the winter is not diminished because we don't have a lot of sun. We just store it in biomass through the summer. And so we need to have enough biomass growing on our sites that we can fuel these systems, including our house.